So today we're going to go a lot more in depth into how good pro audio speakers actually work. It's going to get really technical. We had spoken with Annika, a high schooler, about the basics, and if you haven't seen that video, go check it out. It's a lot of fun. With Austin, a tech director at a local church, we're going to look at just the subwoofer and low mid frequency ranges and see how we can have maximal smoothness in that range and directivity of the sound. Definitely wear headphones for this video because I used a binaural microphone in some of the sequences and we're listening to bass frequencies, which you're not going to hear out of this. Hey Austin, how's it going? Good, how are you? Pretty good. Um, so I'm assuming that we share a love for subwoofers. Yeah, it's a safe, pretty safe bet. Yeah. Uh, well, I brought this microphone. Um, it's actually shaped like human ears, so if you're wearing headphones, you'll be able to hear what we're hearing. And I'm gonna put these on it because it's a little windy today. So the basics of speaker design, when we put a speaker in a box, we can choose to have it completely sealed or we can have a hole to let the air out. Now, the thing is, when we have a hole in it, the speaker typically is a little bit louder and bigger sounding, so manufacturers usually choose that. Uh, and the reason why that is is kind of complex. When the speaker moves in, it pushes air out of the hole, and when the speaker moves out, it sucks air into the hole. So you'd think that those would just kind of cancel each other out, and they actually do. Um, but if the speaker moves fast enough, the direction that the air flows through the opening will actually change direction. So instead of doing this kind of push-pull thing where they're opposite each other, it'll actually change direction and they'll move together. So when the speaker makes a positive air pressure wave by moving out, at the same time, there'll be a positive air pressure wave coming out of the opening and they'll sort of stack up and move out together and uh, vice versa the other direction. We can actually hear this, so if I take and, just for a second, plug the opening with this piece here. Okay, so you can hear how much sound there is, right? Now I'm just gonna open this up. Hear how much louder it is? Yep. So let's draw a speaker box here, and we're going to have an opening where the air can come in and out. So I'm gonna put this little speaker icon on my hand, and that represents the, the speaker driver. So the spring represents the air that's inside the box, and this weight represents the air that's just kinda of hanging out as like a block inside of the, the opening. So at very low frequencies, you can see that the direction of my hand and the air are going to be in opposition with each other to the outside world. And the faster I go, there comes a point when the direction changes and then suddenly my hand and the air are now moving in a way that would produce sound that stacks up with each other in the outside world. Also notice how there's this point right around when the direction is starting to change. When I have to move my hand like very little for there to be a lot of air movement and then if I move my hand really fast, my hand moves a lot but there's little air movement. So we can actually see this change in direction happen if I tape this cotton ball over the opening. Now this cabinet is tuned to about 32 hertz, so I'm going to start by playing 20 hertz, which is well below that, and let's take some slow motion footage. Okay, so let's take a look at what that looks like. So you hear how there was like no bass because they're canceling each other out. Now let's go up to like 45 hertz, which is above the tuning frequency. Tons of bass, right? Okay, let's see what this looks like. All right, now check this out. Oh yeah, it changes direction. So then we're gonna go down just a little bit in frequency and find that point at which, you know, the driver, like my hand, didn't have to move very much in order to make the air in the port move a lot. Let's check this out. Okay, so look at that. Oh, cool. Okay, so then we're gonna go up to like a higher frequency where it changes. The driver is doing most of the work and there's very little air coming out of the vent. So check this out. All right, so see how that works? Oh, interesting. So sometimes manufacturers will actually enclose both sides of the driver in a chamber that can resonate. So like this chamber down here is bigger and it resonates at a lower frequency and this one up here resonates at a higher frequency. 
So they kind of work together, trading off handling different parts of the subwoofer frequency range so that the full range can experience a kind of like resonance and more efficiency. So one of the basic problems with speaker design is that as air moves through the vent and it gets louder and louder, it moves faster, um, the air can flow either smoothly or it can kind of get disturbed near the edges. There's like turbulence that happens. So um, you have to create a shape for the air to flow through that keeps the air on the outsides moving as fast as the air in the middle uh, or else they'll kind of get disrupted. And if they get too disrupted, then the port will actually stop resonating and then the air won't move at all. It'll actually kind of just stand still and be all jumbled up. Um, so they've solved this in a number of ways. So like in this design here, we can see that the, the wall of the vent is actually curved as it goes back. So it keeps the air flowing very smoothly along this kind of aerodynamic path. With this particular product, because it gets so loud, this company had to design a new opening that's actually shaped like a, a nozzle or something, almost like a jet engine nozzle. It gets so narrow way back in here um, it's counterintuitive because you'd think that that would constrict the airflow too much, but actually they did some math to determine the exact amount of curvature and it keeps the air flowing very, very smoothly and there's no turbulence. So this cabinet can get very, very loud. I guess that's why they have smart people working at R&D departments. Okay, so when we walk around the sub, you can hear how it doesn't matter which direction we stand, we hear the bass equally everywhere. Well, what if we wanted to figure out how to control the direction of the base? Well, there's this little trick that we can play. So I brought a second subwoofer out and let's turn them on. Now, I'm gonna tell the one sub to actually do the opposite of whatever the other one's doing. So if that one makes a positive air pressure wave, that one's gonna make a negative air pressure wave and vice versa. Okay, you ready? Here we go. So hear how they basically cancel out, right? Mm -hmm. So let's go ahead and add some distance between these subwoofers that equals a half wavelength at this frequency. So like this is 60 Hertz. So that means that's about just over a hundred inches. So let's go ahead and scoot them apart here. How's that? Okay, so I'm gonna take this cable and I'm gonna lay it on the ground. When we hear cancellation happening, it's gonna be closer to the configuration. And when it sums together, we're gonna move further out. So we're gonna see what the pattern of the sound distribution is. So starting in the middle, because it's canceling. So like we can roughly see the sort of figure eight pattern, right? Where we have canceling anywhere along this line, which is equidistant from the subs. If we wanted to try to pick a direction that the bass goes and cancel it all in the other direction, what we can do is actually bring the subs closer together and then tell one of the subs to actually wait a little bit with its digital signal. Um, so we're gonna do that at one quarter wavelength instead of one half, which would be about 56 inches. So let's start here with our pattern again. We obviously can hear the basses summing nicely. So basically what we did was we moved the cancellation from these two angles to this, we just scooted them back. Now, we can kind of split the difference by maybe not delaying this sub so much, either physically or with the, the digital delay in the signal. So I've just done that now. So if we walk over here, you can kind of tell that now the cancellation point is more right here. And then we get over here and we have a little bit more of a buildup and then we kind of keep going. So if I were to redraw this, I'd have to take and maybe scoot this kind of like toward here. And we can actually steer those cancellation spots depending on how much physical distance and how much delay we put to the signal. So the difficulty with cardioid setups is that you have to pick one frequency to build the setup around where you have perfect summing, perfect canceling, um, but sound changes wavelengths with different frequencies. So the ones that are higher or lower than that, they won't get a perfect cardioid pattern. So in any setup you have this issue where you have to tell the subs to maybe ease off at that central frequency in the range because otherwise you have an imbalance. So let's go inside the building and take a look at some more speakers. Let's do it. So I'm going to give you these two microphones. Um, the one in your left hand is going to be the reference and this one's going to be what we're testing. So go ahead and first of all put them together and put them right in front of the speaker. We're going to 
run some noise through the speaker. Now on the graph, you can see both lines are flat because they're comparing each other and they're picking up the same sound. So there's nothing to report. Um, take the one in your right hand and move it to the vent. So we can see the graph change. Now let's look at the bottom graph for just a second. Here below the tuning frequency of the cabinet, it's up around 180 degrees because they're doing that push-pull thing, right? And then as the frequency increases, it goes through the resonant point of the cabinet, and now they are in phase. And so with these frequencies, they're going to be moving in unison, and they'll stack together if they're relatively the same volume. But at some point, it's interesting, we get high enough, and we reach another resonance of some kind. That's a harmonic. So you have the fundamental tuning frequency of the cabinet, but then at some point you have a harmonic where there's another phase shift that happens back to 180 and then you have more harmonics that constantly are shifting the phase a bunch and it gets kind of crazy. That's why typically subwoofers have a limited range of frequencies that we can have where you, you, know, you get high enough and you have to cross it over with another speaker that takes over from there. At the fundamental, the vent seems to be producing so much more sound than the driver. Like it goes way up in comparison and then kind of levels out. Right about here, they're, they're like about the same volume as each other. But then again, at the harmonic, the vent has a huge spike in relation to the driver. Um, if you think about it, you know, right here you have relatively the same volume between the vent and speaker and they are in phase. That means they're going to, to, to combine well. Um, but here where, again, these are, you know, it's relatively the same volume, but you have a lot of 180 degrees of, of points of phase here. If those come together, they're gonna, they're gonna cancel each other. So it, the subwoofer becomes very unusable up in this range. So what I've done here is I've changed the graph to where we're now using the actual input signal to the subwoofer as the reference. And then the white trace is the mic that you have in front of the driver and then the yellow trace is the mic that's in front of the vent. Okay, so it's interesting because we can see that we have the relative peak in the vent at the tuning frequency. You can see how the driver actually becomes a lot less. So that's kind of interesting as they undergo the phase shift here to becoming in phase, the driver gets less, the vent gets more, but then they kind of level out up here, they're in phase, and then we can see here this next harmonic. Again, we have a dip in the driver volume while the vent takes over, but we have a phase shift. And now they're out of phase here, but in this range, they're pretty close to each other in volume. And again, as we go through other phase shifts, we're still pretty close in volume. Okay, so let's try taking these microphones and putting them kind of out into the world, like maybe put them together up here. So this is kind of what we would hear. They're equidistant between the driver and the vent. Okay, so we can see that the combined response of the subwoofer, below the tuning frequency, they're, they're canceling each other out, and so there's very little output from the sub. And then they hit the tuning frequency and we've got a pretty smooth ride. Sounds great, sounds great. We hit the first harmonic here, and we have some cancellation that takes place. And then we've got a little more summing and then some more canceling. So it just kind of gets crazy up there. So the, the subwoofer is really only usable up to 200 hertz maximum. Probably we'd want to cross it over somewhere in here anyway. Um, so that, and that's just kind of the nature of vented enclosures in general. You, you remember how when a cardio is set up, you have a front sub and a rear sub, and you have to pick a, a set physical distance and a, and a set digital delay, and there's one frequency that's going to have a perfect cardioid pattern, right? It's going to cancel in the rear and some in the front, and above and below that, it kind of gets less ideal, and there's like this limited range of frequencies that, you know, will experience the cardioid effect before it gets crazy. Um, we really need to be able to have a different physical distance and even maybe a different digital delay at every frequency. Well, this company in this cabinet, what they did is they had two subwoofers basically glued together. So these are actually separate. Um, it's this one and this one. There's an internal divider. So you know this driver utilizes this vent and this driver utilizes this vent. Um, and so what happens is they applied the front signal to this driver and the rear signal to this driver. So if you think about it, we saw earlier how the vent handles most of the acoustic energy um, at the fundamental frequency and then as you go higher it, the driver really takes over. So if you think about it, at the lower frequencies, you have more physical distance between the sources, the front and rear sources, than you do at the higher frequencies because they move toward the driver. So it, 
So we naturally have that physical distance change per frequency. And then what they did was they took the signal going to the rear driver and they actually applied a different digital delay time at every frequency. So which is really cool because now we get both. So at the widest range of frequencies, we have the best cardio effect because we're changing the physical distance and the digital delay at each frequency to get the best cardio effect possible. So you hear how much bass there is right now? Like it's really amazing. So let's walk around what is the backside of the cardioid setup. So as we start to get around to the back, you hear how it's, it's getting lower and lower. And by the time we get back here, I mean, we're standing three feet from it and it's just like gone. There's almost no bass. It's really, really effective. So earlier we saw how in a typical vented enclosure, you have the fundamental frequency and then you have a usable range and then you have that harmonic that kind of screws things up above that. Well, the problem is, you know, subwoofers can cross over then with a driver like this, but this has to be able to function all the way up into the mid-range frequencies much, much higher because it doesn't get to cross over till it reaches the frequencies that the horn handles, which are really, really high. So in typical designs, you just kind of had to deal with the fact that there's, you know, there's some cancellations and some weird stuff that happens and try to make the best of it. Um, so this is an older speaker design. Um, by this, this company that exhibits this uh, behavior. So if we play some noise through it, go ahead and put the microphones there. We can see that, you know, we have our fundamental frequency here, we have an in-phase period, and then we have the harmonic, and the vent and the driver are relatively the same volume here, but we have an almost 180 degree phase shift throughout the entire range. So there's gonna be some cancellations and disturbances that, that happen in that range that are just sort of typical of, of these speaker designs since forever. So when we hold the microphones out away from the speaker, which is what we would hear, you can hear how the combination of the vent and the driver produces a relatively smooth response up until that first harmonic, and then we get a pretty uneven response in this upper mid-range here. So, um, that's, you know, not the best, but it was kind of the best that anybody could do back in the day. So, so with the introduction of the new series of this same box, they found that if you have this V-shape cut in the internal wall of the vent, it kind of stops the harmonic from being able to fully form and cause disturbances. So it keeps the phase relationship between the vent and the driver much more linear through a higher frequency range. So we can actually see this phenomenon on the graph. So hold the microphones up to the driver and the vent. So we can see the normal behavior, tuning frequency, we have a phase linear response, but look at the phase above the harmonic. It remains pretty, pretty linear all the way up to here, even this isn't so bad. Um, and the, the relative volume of the port, even though like it's still about the same as the driver up in here, because the phase is so linear, they're gonna combine nicely instead of fight each other and cause cancellations. So holding the mics out away from the speaker again, we can hear the combination of the vent and the driver, which is what we hear, and we can see the frequency response is very, very smooth all the way up through this mid-range area here. I mean, there's very, very few disturbances because almost all the frequencies are summing together nicely, and um, that contributes to the very smooth uh, nature of the sound of this box as opposed to older series. It's a really cool little technology. So with this cabinet here, which also has the same technology built into the vent, we can see that the phase response, although it drifts a little bit during this range here, it's pretty linear up here again, where the volume is relatively the same. During the section where it drifts even a little bit, the relative volume of the vent to the driver is very, very low. So it, it would otherwise cancel, but because it's so low in comparison, it's kind of out of the way. It doesn't really matter that much. So again, we're holding the mics out away from the speaker, which is what we hear in reality. And again, we can see that the total response of the speaker is very, very smooth all the way through that critical mid-range. That's why these speakers sound so good these days from this particular company. So Austin, yeah, thanks again for doing this. I mean, I had a lot of fun. What would you think? Yeah, um, I, I've definitely learned so much more about these products, um, especially with the ones that we use here. Uh, you know, the correlation between the unique, you know, cardio design and the unique vent design, um, you know, surprised me. It puts out a pretty, pretty smooth frequency response, and then the just total, you know, directional control of the low end is just pretty, pretty rad. Awesome. All right, man. Yeah. Thanks yeah, so much. Yeah,